in the town of Ponyville. Nightmare Night was a holiday that had been looked forward to by nearly everyone of all ages. From the costumes to the mountains of candy, from the spooky houses to the festival with loud but creepy music, a majority of the locals looked forward to participating in its activities. Soon after the leaves had turned blood red, the town immediately began to decorate the streets with paper bats and jack-o'-lanterns. On that autumn night, as the folds carried out the tradition of trick-or-treating, six creatures roamed about the fairground in disguise. For many of them, this was their first experience with the holiday, but they quickly grasped onto the idea of dressing up as the folklore of their places of origin. The dragoness named Smolder had on a black sheet that draped over her while wearing the mask of a grinning horned demon of white and crimson. Gallus the Griffin used a combination of cardboard armor and makeup to make himself look pale to resemble a ghost warrior. Ocellus, who was a changeling that could easily shapeshift, went about as a timber wolf. Yona the Yak, however, used a dusting of white powder and plastic teeth to try to present herself as a yeti. The hippogriff Silverstream dressed up in the scariest thing that she could think of, a paper mache shark, while Sandbar the Earth Pony decided to go with a pirate costume, complete with a three-corner hat and a black beard. So what else exactly do you ponies do? Smolder asked as she popped another hard candy into her mouth. I'd like to do something else other than eating. There should be a ton of stuff to do. Sandbar answered, adjusting his hat. We could always go through a haunted maze or play a few more carnival games. I'm not sure if I want to go with something scary. Ocellus admitted. And I'm not too keen on letting my bits fall through some of these scams. Gallus said as he narrowed his eyes at a booth with ring tossing. What entertaining? Yona questioned. Do ponies put on show? I never saw a magic show before. Silverstream observed. This could be really fun. As the six friends debated on what to do and where to go, Gallus let his eyes scan around the fairgrounds, this way and that, until his eyes came across a solid black tent with a few posters up front. Hey, what's this? Observing where he was pointing at, the students approached a tent with posters that made it clear that this must be a magic show. It had in each poster a thin-looking Pegasus stallion in a sharp black and white suit and waistcoat. Some of the things the posters advertised were the typical tricks from sawing a mare in half to doing a straitjacket escape over a lion's mouth. However, there was one poster that caught their attention. It was the image of the magician looming over what looked like a life-size doll of a cold. It wore clothing that was three centuries behind, with a blank expression and glassy eyes staring back at them. Underneath were the words, See Svengali come to life, only here at Naturno's magic tent. The magic tent? Smolder raised an eyebrow. That's kind of a dumb name if you ask me. How uncreative can you get? What this? Yona asked. I think it's a magic show, Sandbar said. With all of these posters around, they look like some stage magic. Can't say I've heard of the magician's name, though. Gallus walked towards the entrance. In doing so, he found himself questioned as to where he was headed. Let's go see this guy. At least it would give us something entertaining. You guys coming? I never saw a magic show before, Silverstream said. This could be really fun. The friends agreed to take a look inside, so they parted the flaps of the tent and entered. It was dark inside. The only lights that helped illuminate the small space were candles and a spotlight that shone on the magician on stage. The space they entered was crowded with curious onlookers who watched the Pegasus in the midst of performing a magic trick. As the students walked in, he passed through a frame that had a layer of paper which he was puncturing a hole through. The audience seemed at awe as he stepped through the other side of the torn paper, only to pull it off to reveal a mirror in its frame. Thank you! He said as he took a bow, while the magician's assistants moved the mirror off stage. Looking up, he spotted the six students and spoke again. Ah, I see some new faces in the crowd. Welcome to the magic tent, new friends. I am Naturno the Illusionist, and you are just in time for the final act tonight. Another assistant pushed a large sheet-covered object onto the small stage before Naturno turned to it. I have saved the best for last. Before I continue on, I must explain the brief history of what you are about to see. The name of Svengali is commonly known for being a fictional character in the 895 novel Tribli that spoke about an evil hypnotist. 
What many don't know is that the name itself predates the book. The first ever mentioned name of Svengali can be traced to the 8th century to pre-revolutionary prints, where a mute mind reader tapped on a board that correctly guessed the names of the audience and conveyed messages. It took on the form of a little cult. But what was extraordinary about Svengali is that he wasn't a pony of flesh and blood. Remarkably, he was a machine, an early robot that is known as an automaton. The creator of this masterpiece, named Lorlage, used the mane and death mask of his son who passed away of scarlet fever at the age of six. Even with its completion in 783, it is said that he had spent years trying to tune and refine his creation to the point that he nearly went mad. The automaton went up the ranks of the royal courts in France, even to the king himself. However, what Svengali did was so shocking and frightening that the king had its maker executed while keeping the automaton locked away. After the French Revolution, the machine was passed on to a series of collectors, mechanics, magicians, and occultists, all trying to figure out exactly how Svengali worked. Seventy years ago, it disappeared and no pony knew where it went. Five years ago, it reappeared at an auction in Philadelphia in which I bought it. During those said five years, I have spent some time taking apart and restoring it back to its originality. Here tonight, for the first time since 788, it is to perform for you exactly the way it was then. Taking part of the sheet, Naturno pulled on it to reveal a life-sized, almost lifelike doll of a cult. The first thing the ponies noticed right off was the clothing that had been out of fashion for centuries. A blue overcoat with breeches that had simple buttons with a white lace collar. The mane was a dull blonde with a black bow that tied up in the back. But the most disconcerting feature of this doll was its face. Made of plaster, it was painted stone gray with blue glass eyes peering through. The expression on its face was perhaps the most unnerving part of it as it was on one hoof emotionless. Yet, on the other, there was something ominous about it, about him. There was a sort of knowing look in his glassy eyes. In his left hoof, he held a stick, while next to the machine was a board that had every letter on the alphabet with numbers. What makes this machine so remarkable, Naturno said, is that this is one of the very few surviving true automatons to exist. And what do I mean by that, you may ask? As he said this, he walked over to the machine and opened up the face and barrel, exposing the complicated gears and springs. By its definition, a true automaton is one that once set in motion operates completely on its own without any outside help. What you see of this small cult is that he is made up of over 15,000 individual parts. Among them are dozens of yards of copper tubing, 6,000 cogs, 400 springs, and about 7,000 gears. The winding itself takes half an hour. I'm about to make the last few tightening of a couple of springs. The magician pulled out a key from his pocket, which he then inserted in the chest of the machine, turning it a few times, resulting in several resounding clicks echoing across the silent audience. He then did the same to the face. Once he was done, he closed up both the barrel and muzzle piece. And now, he's back to his original performing state. As Naturno backed away from the automaton, an assistant climbed on stage to give him a small bell. At this point, all of you may be rightfully asking what exactly this thing does. What makes this machine so marvelous is that he is perhaps the only one of his kind which responds only to the sound of this bell. Watch. Carefully supporting the bell by his wing, the magician held it up in the air for a tense moment before gently ringing it. The doll responded by looking up at him with undivided attention. At this point, Gallus raised a claw. Uh, excuse me? All eyes turned to the young griffin. Okay, that's impressive and all, but did you say this thing got its creator executed? I'm glad you brought that up, Naturno said. In fact, if you could come up here with me, I'll show you. And so Gallus flew up on the stage and stood next to the magician. Now, just to be clear, you have never met me before or seen any of my previous shows. The young griffin shrugged. I didn't know you existed until my friends and I walked by. 
Naturno turned to the remaining friends. And you all can confirm this. They told him it was true. Perfect, he said as he turned to Gallus. Before I demonstrate what this automaton does, it should be said that after the French Revolution, rumors arose that the doll possessed supernatural abilities, allowing it to possess members of the audience. Gallus folded his arms. You're kidding me, right? But the magician smiled. Ah, a non-believer. Now then, if you would kindly stand right there. Yes, like that. Next, I want you to look at the doll, straight into his eyes and nowhere else. Although he rolled his eyes, the young griffin went along with it as he gazed into the glass eyes of the automaton. For a long few moments, nothing happened. Everyone in the audience could see that the one having a staring contest with a doll wasn't impressed. Okay, this is getting ridiculous, he said at last. Come on guys, let's get out of- But when he tried to move, he felt paralyzed. As much as he tried to turn his torso, or budge his arms, or even try to turn his head away, he felt his muscles being locked into place. Huh? So, are we gonna go or what? Smolder questioned. Uh, guys? I can't move. Oh, very funny, Sandabar said sarcastically. No, seriously guys, I can't move. What's going on? As you can see, Naturno waved a hoof. The doll has now taken hold of his body. Like him, he is powerless to move on his own. Dude, this isn't funny! Gallus interjected. Ocellus's ears perked up. Guys, he's not lying, he's afraid! If you think about your right arm, for example, the magician explained, ignoring the concern of his audience. You'll find nothing happens as it is locked into place. Keep your eyes open, I want you to see what's going on. For if you try to move it like so, he moved his right foreleg up and down. It won't budge. Yet when I ring the bell, lifting the bell up high again, he said, The doll's right arm will come up. Now, watch what happens to his. Naturno rang the silver bell, and in response, the automaton's right hoof moved upward. At the exact same time, so did Gallus's rise, shakingly upwards, a look of panic etched across his face. I'm not doing this! He cried out. I swear, this isn't me that's doing it! And his arm will lock into place if he tries to pull it down. Another ring from the bell, and at the same time that the machine's arm stopped mid-air, so did Gallus's as it quivered stiffly. If he tries to lower it on his own, it will only lock tighter. Yet, when I ring the bell again... Another ring. Both the doll and the griffin's arms slowly came down. As this happened, an assistant rolled a wheelchair behind the frightened griffin as the magician walked up to him. Alright, I'm going to put you in the chair behind you and I'm going to help you into it. Don't worry, this next part is harmless. He did so, moving Gallus's limbs up for him as he lowered him into the chair. Gallus's arms still remained locked. After he was turned away from the doll's eyes, Gallus felt like he could move again. At this point, there is a legitimate way of explaining what just happened. Such as that it could have been through the power of suggestion. That the reason why this fellow here moved his arm at the same time the doll did, was that his mind unconsciously copied its movements. But what's even more fascinating, is that things would happen when the machine and the subject weren't looking at each other. In fact, such demonstrations became too much, so much so that in 873 wizards were called to perform an exorcism on Svengali, which is incredible as for the first time in history, the most powerful unicorns of the day had to perform all the rites of a full exorcism on a machine that is usually meant for possessed ponies or haunted houses. The following demonstration which you are about to see is one of the reasons why they did it. An assistant came on stage and handed Gallus a blackboard and a piece of chalk. This must be for your eyes only, Naturno explained. I want you to write your name on that, and then immediately place it face down. And to be fair, I will turn around while you must keep your written name away from the audience. And if any of you know his name, please remain silent in order for this to work. The magician turned his back on the griffin while Gallus scribbled his name down, out of sight of the audience before placing the board down. Okay, I'm ready. Very well, you may now turn around, Naturno instructed, 
After Gallus got up, keeping the blackboard face down, he turned to look at the automaton. Now, for the most remarkable part of this demonstration, when I ring the bell, Svengali, would you please look into his eyes and correctly spell out the name of the individual that you see in front of you? Would you do that now? With the ring of the bell, the machine moved its head to look directly in the eyes of the griffin. A moment later, its left hoof rose up, lifting the stick which it held, and tapped on the board. What it spelled out made the young participant drop his beak. G. A. L. L. U. S. Ha. How? Is that your name? Naturno questioned. Gallus, what is written on the board? The griffin went over and showed the audience his name. Isn't that fascinating? That centuries-old machine has correctly guessed your name. That's really creepy. Before the magician could reply, a grinding of gears was heard as he and everyone in the tent turned towards the automaton that was moving its left foreleg on its own, tapping on the board to spell out, pausing now and then as it wrote out a message. H. E. L. P. G. A. L. L. U. S. C. O. M. E. W. I. T. H. M. E. There was a stunned silence as the griffin roughly grabbed the magician's suit. Stop this right now! He growled. I admit that this was pretty impressive at first, but this is going too far. I I'm sorry, I've, I've never seen him do this before, Naturno said. Well, whatever it is, stop it! I was willing to play along, but this crosses the line. No, really, I have never seen Svengali do this before, the magician insisted. Just as Gallus was about to march off stage, telling his friends that they shouldn't waste any more time, the candles in the spotlights went out. In the pitch black darkness, Naturno called out among the rising cacophony of voices that there was nothing to worry about, that his unicorn assistants would relight the candles. In a moment, the candelabras were lit, and everyone in the tent was still there, all except for Svengali. Much to everyone's shock, even Naturno, the automaton was missing. All that remained was the board, and the stick he used to tap out with that lay against it, fully creeped out. Gallus flew over to his friends and ushered them out while the audience started to panic. Okay, what just happened? Silverstream asked the same question that was on all their minds. We should get out of here. Gallus insisted, and before he could move any further, Smolder stood in his way. What's gotten you all spooked? She questioned. That was all an act, right? Okay, first of all, I was telling the truth back there. I never saw the guy in my life... Or that... thing! And I swear on all that's holy, I wasn't making any of this up. I mean, you heard what Ocellus said, right? I was, and am, getting really scared. There was a moment of silence between the six of them. You know what? I'm done. Where are you going? Silverstream asked as the young griffin quickly turned his back and started to march away. To bed. I'm sorry guys, but I just had it with tonight. I don't want to deal with any creepy dolls and all. Besides, I've read enough ghost stories to know that I shouldn't provoke something this weird. So, if you don't mind, I'm heading back to school and straight to bed. Sandbar trotted up to him. Hey, if you're going back, then I'll come with you too. It's never a good idea to go out on Nightmare Night alone. Whatever. His Earth Pony friend followed close by him as they walked back to Twilight School in silence. Soon, the bright orange lights and grinning jack-o'-lanterns faded away with the laughter and screams of the fair as they walked down the streets of Ponyville. They continued at a trotting pace through a dimmer side of town, where very few ponies were around and no trick-or-treaters in sight. But as they walked on, Gallus' ears perked up as they caught something. He didn't notice it at first, even as they entered a quieter place in town. In fact, he wasn't too sure if he was hearing it at all. He stopped suddenly. Gallus? Sandabar asked when his friend held up a claw. Do you hear that? The pony stood there too in silence as his ears stood straight up. Hear what? I thought... Gallus shook his head. 
Never mind, let's keep going. Sorry, but hear what? Forget it, dude, it's nothing. Gallus said. Sandbar remained silent as they continued on. For a minute, nothing seemed to happen, until Gallus paused once more looking over his shoulder. What was... you okay, dude? Gallus hesitated. It must be that stupid magic show. He grumbled. This might sound like a really weird question, but do you hear any, uh, grinding noises? Nothing. Just the wind and a few ponies talking. Okay, it's just me then. He sighed. I'm letting an ancient robot get to me. Maybe that's it. Come on, let's get back to our dorm already. Don't tell me you're getting paranoid. Whoever said I was? The young griffin questioned defensively. Just keep moving. I just want to go to bed. And so the two friends continued onward through the street. All the while, Gallus tried in vain to ignore the soft sound of gears and hoofsteps behind him. Though he continually looked behind him, nothing and no one was following them. It's just your mind playing tricks. He thought. Keep it together. Don't freak out. You're just hearing things is all. Unbeknownst to Sandbar, his roommate across the room couldn't fall asleep. His mind kept forcing itself to return to that uncomfortable moment on stage. He shifted this way and that, trying and hoping that sleep would come at last. How did that guy do it? He wondered. I mean, that was just a trick, right? It has to be. Headmare Twilight did say that there's some ponies out there that put on shows like that for entertainment. If anyone looks behind it, they'll find that it's just a clever trick. That robot thing is a mechanical machine after all, so something was controlling it to spell out my name. Maybe from behind or from the top of the tent with a mirror or something. Plus, it could have just slipped underneath the floor when all the lights went out. But, how come I couldn't move? I really tried to move my arm to get off the stage, but why couldn't I? And why was the guy acting so uncomfortable when the doll thing disappeared? I mean, he could be acting, but... Gallus finally cracked an eye at the glow-in-the-dark hands on the alarm clock. It was past three in the morning, but he felt as if he had been laying there for much longer. He wanted to sleep, but his stubborn mind refused to do so. Another turn on the bed, he rested there for a minute or two. Then his ears perked up as he heard the sound of something outside their door. It was a soft but unmistakable grinding with a few clicking sounds. Gallus sat upright as he rubbed his eyes, pausing to hear what crept in the dark. In the very dim light from the shaded window, he glanced around the room to be sure that nothing was out of place, and nothing was. With piles of books and posters on the wall, Everything seemed to be the same, but from behind the door, he heard the unmistakable sound of something being scratched across the wood. Gallus could guess that whatever was making the sound was small, as it was only heard coming from the lower end of the door. Tossing the blankets and sheets aside, he quietly got up and carefully walked over the floorboards to put his sensitive ear on the doorframe. He felt his blood become like ice. He heard the telltale mechanical sound of gears like putting an ear to a grandfather clock a rhythmic ticking, with a few impatient clicks, as if the very grinding and moaning of gears and cogs were waiting on him. Slowly, as to not wake his sleeping roommate, he turned the knob of the door with care until it couldn't be turned. Gallus positioned himself at the door's opening end as he gently cracked it open to see what was on the other side. Almost expecting that the automaton was right there with an evil expression and its dead glass eyes. That increasing dread turned into confusion as there was not so much as a shadow in the very dimly lit hallway. He swung the door wider as there wasn't anything there except near darkness. Even the noise seemed to have stopped, leaving nothing in the air but silence. Hello? Gallus asked as quietly as he could. He poked his head out, but saw no one. Any creature here? But all was still. As much as his eyes adjusted to the dark, his ears twisted this way and that. There was nothing out of the ordinary. No hint that anything was out of place. Even as he walked down the hall, almost expecting something to come out and scare him, he checked the student's lounge. But even among the fake cobwebs, the black and orange streamers, the carved out pumpkins and the candy wrappers, everything looked the same. With a sigh, he went over to the kitchenette area to get a glass of water. 
You're just getting worked up over nothing. He muttered to himself. I'd bet by morning all this creepy stuff will just go away. I mean, what do I have to worry about? After taking that drink, he shrugged it off and began to make his way down the hallway. However, before he could reach his room, he found himself petrified as a small bell was heard. Gallus could not move anything except his eyes. He looked down at his claws that only trembled. Even when he tried to call for help, he found that even his beak was sealed shut. Another ring, and he witnessed his own claw move down to the floor. Another ring, and he witnessed his own claw move down to the floor. Almost mechanically, as if some force was making him stand at attention like a guard's a statue. But still, he could see no one as fear took a piggyback ride. The sound of a little bell rang again, and he turned around to face the other direction. Another ring, and his claws and paws were carrying him forward like a marionette as his limbs moved forward while his mind was screaming to stop. He wanted to claw into the floor, run into a wall, bite onto an edge, just so that he would gain control of his body again. Another ring, and he froze in the middle of the student's lounge, where his ears picked up the sound of gears grinding. He felt something heavy climb onto his back. All the while, hearing every click and reeling of cogs and gears, that was when Gallus realized that the machine had climbed onto his back. As much as he wanted to turn his head to look at the automaton, his neck was still locked into place. Gallus heard another ring as he involuntarily moved forward again, this time towards the front doors and into the main courtyard of the sleeping school. The griffin felt his heartbeat rapidly and his breathing hyperventilated as he could not call out for help. Every so often that tiny bell would ring for him to turn this way or climb up these stairs. He prayed that someone would still be awake, that someone might be able to help him. Yet, as he was forced to walk and climb ever upwards from one floor to the next, there was not a soul anywhere as the doll on his back controlled his every movement. Where is this thing taking me? His mind screamed. Help me! Some creature wake up! Help me! Gallus was unable to force himself to stop as he climbed up to the roof of the school. He climbed up higher to one spire, towards a window which overlooked the sleeping, unsuspecting town. It was only then that he stopped. He felt that weight climb down off of him before hearing that bell again. To his horror and helplessness, he realized what this machine wanted him to do. His limbs grabbed on the stone as he climbed up to the window seal, standing on his hind legs, looking down at the several floors of nothing between him and the ground. No! Oh, goddesses, no! Another ring from the tiny bell, and a hind leg was lifted up while his wings remained firmly shut. There was nothing he could do as he felt his own center of gravity being shifted forward. Another ring of the bell, and he screamed all the way down. Naturno was horrified as he picked up the morning local paper. There, on the front page was the headline, Sleepwalking Student Killed After Jumping Off Roof. What shocked him wasn't the headline but rather the name of the student that leapt to his death, Gallus. The griffin from his show last night was found dead on the rocky ground. Not again! The magician turned towards the automaton that sat there in the corner of his tent between all the other props of his show. Svengali, you've promised that you wouldn't do this. This is the third time this month. Third! You gave me your word that you would leave their minds once the show was over. The doll gave no reply. I should have listened to those warnings, Naturno vented. That you were far more valuable in pieces than causing one death after another. No, this is the final straw. I cannot put you on stage anymore. I refuse to take care of you rather than let you rust. Before he could reach for something blunt and heavy to smash the antique machine into bits, his body was paralyzed by the ringing of a bell in Svengali's hoof.